Today is February 21st. The title of this message is Secret Holiness. Secret Holiness. Let's turn, if you will, to, uh, we'll start out in Numbers 20. Numbers 20. And we're going to begin in the, in the first verse. Amen. Numbers 21. In the first month, the whole Israelite community arrived at the desert of Zin, and they stayed at Kadesh, where Miriam died and was buried. Now there was no water for the community, and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. They quarreled with Moses and said, If only we had died when our brothers fell dead before the Lord. Why did you bring the Lord's community into this desert, that we and our livestock should die? Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain or figs, grapevines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. How many of you were there at the Monday night Bible study? We learned in Exodus 15 that the Lord intended in bringing them through the desert. He intended in bringing them through the long path because the short path, there there they would face opposition, right? And their hearts would be turned to go back. So the Lord intentionally brought them the long way through the desert. And here they're complaining. Moses and Aaron, Moses and Aaron, verse 6, went from the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell face down. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. The Lord said to Moses, take the staff and you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together. Speak to that rock before their eyes and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so they and their, their livestock can drink. Everyone say, speak to the rock. Verse 9, so Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence, just as he had commanded him. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with the staff. Water gushed out, and the community and their livestock drank. Now, some of you are familiar with the story. You're familiar with the fact that because of Moses did this, he was not allowed to go into the, the promised land, the land that was promised that Moses would bring the people out from Egypt into. Some of you are familiar with that. And the common, the common uh, thought here, the common idea is that, that God was angry at them for what? For striking it instead of speaking to it. Amen? That's, that's the common thought. That's the, the idea out there. Let's read on. Verse 12, but the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. Because they did what? They did not trust the Lord to honor him as holy. The, or the, the word here, honor, is the same as holy. You'll find that interesting here in a second. They did not honor the Lord to treat him as holy. The sin that they commit, the reason why God was so angry. Take it back to verse 6. Moses and Aaron went out from the assembly to the entrance of the what? The tent of meeting and fell face down. And the glory of the Lord appeared. We're going to talk a second about the glory of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Let's get into it. Some of you, if if you're not familiar with Hebrew words, Hebrew Hebrew, words, Thought, you will be today. Uh, We believe that when God gave his name to the nation of Israel, what language was that in? It wasn't in Latin. It wasn't in Greek. It wasn't in English, as as we read. It was in Hebrew. And so the revelation given to God's people was in Hebrew. And so if you want a fuller revelation of who God is, let's go back to the original text. We're going to get into some words. We're going to go deep. We're going to go all the way into these. The the phrase in verse 6 The glory of the Lord, the glory of the Lord appeared is, uh, sorry, let me erase this real quick. The glory of the Lord appeared only occurs in the Torah five times. For some of you that believe (laughs) that five is a gracious number, then you'll you'll have fun with this. The, the, The glory of the Lord appeared occurs five times in Torah. That means the law. That means the first five books of the Older Testament. In all of the cases, the first one is uh, Moses and Aaron uh, 
sacrificing for a sin offering and the glory of the Lord appeared. The other four have to do with uh, grievous sin that is occurring in the camp and the glory of the Lord appeared. Do, do some study on that and you'll find some interesting things, I'm sure. The glory of the Lord appeared. This word glory in Hebrew is kabod. I wrote down the, uh, the strong numbers so that you can, you can do the research yourself and find out these things. Kabod. The definition of kabod has to do with majesty and wealth, riches. Physical riches, as it is used many times in the Older Testament, uh, it is, it is uh, used in, it is used, let's see, in Genesis 45, 13, where Joseph is speaking to his brothers and he's telling them to go. And he's saying, you shall leave my father, you shall, you shall leave here and you shall tell my father of the glory that you saw in Egypt. It's used in 2 Chronicle 1, 2. Let's turn there on the board. If you can't read my handwriting. Let's go there on the screen. 2 Chronicles 1, 12. Did I say 1, 2 or 1, 12? Therefore, wisdom and knowledge will be given to you, and I will also give you wealth, riches, and honor, such as no king who was before you ever had, and none after you will have. God is speaking to Solomon. Let's turn the screen to Psalm 19. Psalm 19, 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. The heavens are declaring a message of the riches and the majesty of God. Turn to Psalm 29, 2. We're going through these so you could see the definition of glory. Ascribe to the Lord the glory do His name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. Psalm 104.31 says, The glory of the Lord will endure forever. Isaiah 6.3 says, The whole earth is full of His glory. The whole earth is full of His majesty, His riches. Ezekiel 3.23, The glory of the Lord stood. Let's turn to that on the screen. Because you need to see that. Says the, so I got up and went out to the plain, and the glory of the Lord was standing there, like the glory I had seen by the Kabar River, and I fell face down. Ezekiel is seeing physically the riches and the majesty and the wealth and the glory of God, and he falls face down. This word, kabod, it also means in the literal sense, it means a physical weight. If you read in 1 Samuel 4, <laughs> you will see that that. It says about Eli that he could not get up because he was heavy. That is a derivative of the word kabod, except it adds a vav in the word. And so just one letter, one letter in the Hebrew word changes sort of the, the, the connotation of the word. That's why it's important to study these words, get into the depth of them, because you can get a different meaning. Hebrew is much more complex than English. But it, it, it also refers in a literal sense to a heaviness, a weightiness, a, a, a pressure. Like when, when you speak of a matter that is heavy, it carries some weight to it. It carries some weight to it. Any of you ever seen the movie uh, National Treasure? Yes. Yeah? You know, you know the scene. The scene where they have been searching. They have, they have found secret after secret. They have been searching and searching and searching. And then they find a room full of treasures. They find this room full of treasures that had been hidden from the world. Wouldn't it seem kind of silly if, if somebody just got down and pulled out his, 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 uh, his iPhone and started playing some games on it? I mean, that would seem absurd, would it not? Yeah. If somebody's just like, oh, man, I don't feel like being here. Let's go, let's go to Whataburger, you know? <laughs> I would rather be somewhere else. It's because that carries some weight to it. It's a matter to be taken seriously that they had found this treasure and it is the same as, as this kabod, which is, which is before them. 
It is the weightiness of the majesty of God. It is the weightiness of his, his, all of His riches, all of His glory. Like the psalm said, the heavens are declaring the glory of God. This is what is appearing in the tent of meeting before them. The word, let's, let's go to Yahweh. If you've ever done a word study on Yahweh, as a matter of fact, let's turn to Exodus 3. Turn with your Bibles into Exodus 3. If you've ever studied the name Yahweh, it will drive you almost mad if you study that. It's like, it's like trying to divide zero by zero. You ever try to do that? What's, what comes up in your calculator? It doesn't say zero. It says error. <laughs> Right? It's because this, this name, when it is given to refer to a person, it is so complex and it is so um, extraordinary that, it, that it, that's why Orthodox Jews will not utter that name. It is the unutterable name of God. And it is used in Numbers 20. They could have used uh, El Elohim. They could have used Adonai Elohim. They did not. They cho- the writer chose Yahweh for a very specific reason. Yahweh is the national Jewish name for God. It is the national Jewish name. It is the unutterable name. When we hear in the word about the Hashem of God, it is referring to this. It bears his, his, his body of work, his attributes, his character is all wrapped up in the unutterable name of God. In Exodus 3.14, let's, God said to Moses, I... <laughs> God's telling Moses, you're going to go to Pharaoh, you're going to speak for me, you're going to tell him to let my people go so that they will worship the Lord in the desert. And God says to Moses, or Moses asked God, rather, what should I tell, who should I tell them is sending me? God said to Moses, I am who I am. In Hebrew, this, this is, let me write this down. It is Eye Ashir Eye. How do we get Yahweh from this word? Eye Ashir Eye. The Strong's number for Eye is 1961. Good year, by the way. <laughs> 834 for Ashir. Again, if you want to do a fuller depth of the study of these words, I challenge you to do it. I challenge you to go to find for yourself. But I'll tell you in brief the meaning of this. Ashir is a pronoun. Pronoun. I know you can't read that, but it's there. Pronoun. And aye is a verb. In English, the writers translated this word aye to I am, and ashir to who I am, or that in some translations. That's not the only meanings of these words. If you look at them, a, uh, this word right here, 1961, is actually the verb haya. Aye is a, is a derivative word of haya. It's one tense of haya. It, it's, it's one of the tenses, I'm sorry, of haya. And haya literally means to be. It means pure existence. It means, it, it means I am, I will, I, I, I am becoming. I, it, it just means pure existence. And asher is a pronoun which can, which can have several different meanings. It can mean that. It can mean which. It can mean who. It can mean all of these things. So when, when God tells Moses his name, he doesn't define himself into, like, for, for example, my name is Justin. That, that means, it means justice. Uh, I wasn't named by a Hebrew woman, uh, which would have named me by my function. Uh, But that's one meaning of it. God gives Moses a name that has no singular meaning at all. Not Not one meaning. As a matter of fact, if you were to study the depth of this phrase, you would find out that it has an infinite meaning because he is an infinite God. The name of God is infinite because he is infinite. He is infinite. We talked about, I love the study that Brother Alex did. Uh, week one, Discipleship Helps. We talked about the transcendence of God. That meaning that everything about God forever infinitely increases and never ends. We talk about the love of God, it never ends. We talk about the holiness of God, it never ends. It is always transcending, transcending, transcending because he is infinite. 
He is infinite. There is no end to it. And when God gives the name to Moses, Eye Asher Eye, he is saying, I am who I am. I am that what I am. I will be who I will be. I am becoming what I am. Everything all at once, that is the name of God. Amen? Amen. And this word right here is appeared is Ra. Sorry. Ra. Ah. It means to appear. Uh, I've got several scriptures on it, and they're all amazing. Uh, but, but look up this word. You'll just see that, that it is used all over the Older Testament for, uh, and God saw that the wickedness of man increased on earth. It refers to physically seeing, and it can also, it can also mean figuratively seeing, as if you are perceiving something. But in most cases, it is seeing. It is actually used as literally seeing. And so take these words together. The kabod of Yahweh appeared at the tent of meeting. The heaviness, the weight, the majesty, the riches of the infinite one who never ceases to be appeared before the temple, uh, 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 appeared before the tent of meeting. That takes a whole different meaning as to what's happening in here. And the scripture does it not. The glory of the Lord, the glory of, of Yahweh God is appearing to Moses and Aaron at the tent of meeting. This happens uh, all over the Older Testament at the tent of meeting when something is going on, when, somebody's face, uh, when, when the entire people of God are facing a trial, when the people of God are rebelling against Moses. The glory of God appears. The glory, the kabod of Yahweh appears. So this is not just, this is not just they, were at a, they were at a prayer meeting and, and they felt a good feeling. This is not just uh, they found a song written by, by Bethel that touched their heart. Okay, you get what I'm saying here? It is much stronger. This word glory is a masculine, uh, what is it, a verb? No, it's a noun. It's a masculine noun. Amen. There's a feminine noun for it. And I'm not going to go too far into that, but the masculine noun shows you that this is something strong. This is not, this is not just, just a passive thing that's going on. This is a strong occurrence that the glory of God is physically appearing before the tent of meeting. And what did Moses and Aaron do? When God showed up, He spoke to them something very specific. And what did they do? They, Moses didn't do what He told them to. Was God so much angry at them not, telling, not doing what he told them to? Well, yes, he was, but I think something deeper is going there. It's almost like Moses and Aaron had gotten so used to the glory of God descending on the tent of meeting that they treated it as common. Let's go into this word right here, uh, holy. I'm going to erase this. God tells, tells Moses in verse 12, But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy. That word honor also is, is the same word used as holy. You didn't, uh, <laughs> we were to literally say this, it would say you did not holy me enough to treat me as holy. Uh, let's go into the word holy. Amen? Amen. The word holy has a, has a totally different meaning in English as it means in Hebrew. Uh, in, the, in our cultural understanding of, of the word holy, uh, the, you know, we say things like, like, hey, bro, how's your holiness, man? You doing good? Hey, how's your, uh, you know, are you, are, you, are you walking in holiness in the secret place? And that all usually refers to what we would understand as, uh, perf- like, are you being are you being without sin? Are you sinning? Are you not sinning? But that's not exactly what it means in the Hebrew. The word, that, that would more fit a definition of the word righteousness. How are you doing in your righteousness? How are you doing in, in your uh, walk with sin? As we have a relationship with God, it ought to, it, you ought to have a relationship with sin. I don't believe that you can ever say you have a relationship with God and you do not have a relationship with sin. Because when you meet God, your relationship with God begins and your relationship with sin ends. Those two things have to change at the same time. If you do not have a new relationship with sin, you haven't met God. I'll just, I'll just say it. 
I, all the, all of the, the, the garbage that is being sold over the internet, that, that this walk with Christ is about uh, a feeling, is about you know, love and acceptance over everyone, that's not it. It is to free you of your sin. It is to, to change your relationship with sin. Amen? Amen? Righteousness. Let's go into the word holiness, if we will. The word holiness here is... Kadash. Some of you will recognize that word. Uh, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, it is the Ruach Ha Kodesh, another derivative of the word Kadash. The Ruach Ha Kodesh. This means, this is 6942, Strong's number, and it means to be set apart. To be set apart, to be separate, to be sanctified. To be sanctified. Moses and Aaron did not honor God after what they had seen enough to regard him as set apart. Enough to regard him as sanctified. You know, you know in the word in the Newer Testament when Jesus says, uh, be holy. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Uh, the Lord says in the older, be holy for I am holy. He is saying, be set apart for I am set apart. Be sanctified for I am sanctified. The word really doesn't have to do much with sin, but it does. If you could follow that trail, it does. It has, to re- it has to do with your relation to God. It has to do with whether or not you are separating yourself from everything that is unholy, everything that is not holy, and that you are being set to God. So when God said, you did not regard me as holy, he's saying, you didn't treat me as set apart. You did not treat me as Uncommon. You didn't treat my presence as a rare thing. Instead, you treated it as common. You treated it as common. God forbid that they would go into there because they got so comfortable with the glory of the Lord that they treated it as a common thing. They had no more reverence for God and His name and His glory. When, when God's glory came, they, they no longer had that effect to where they trembled They trembled at God's holiness. Instead, they treated it as just an everyday occurrence. As an everyday occurrence. And how is it that we do the same thing? We do the same thing. The name of God in in our land is so treated as a common thing that people wear t-shirts that say Jesus. People wear t-shirts that say God. And they have no idea what they're displaying. They have no idea what it is. You know, God is very serious about his name. That's why one of the Ten Commandments says, do not, do not say my name in vain. God's name is to be reverenced. His holiness is to be reverenced. His glory is to be reverenced. And many times in our lives, we do not see the glory of God because we treated it as common. Why would God continue to show himself? Any, any of you husbands or, or wives here, how many of you would continue to, to and we'll just go right into this. How many of you would continue to, to do the special things for your spouse if they, if they just disregarded it as, as, as nothing? Huh? If they disregarded it as nothing, as if nothing was happening. And God, and, and God is showing up in a very special way. He, God is, is appearing before them, and they're treating it as a common occurrence. They had become so dull, they had become so, so lax in meeting with the Lord that, that the Lord's glory, His riches, His majesty was treated as just an un, as a, as a common occurrence, as if nothing was happening at all. And that's what caused Moses and Aaron to go and do something the Lord told them not to do because they didn't take note of the Lord. They didn't take note of His presence. They didn't take note of the weightiness of meeting with Yahweh. They didn't take note of that. Many times, 
And and I speak for myself. Many times you you can go and you can go and you can go and then and then you you end up in a place where you were just like, Lord, I don't feel you anymore. I don't feel you. You need to ask yourself, when was that moment that you started treating the Lord as a common thing? When we start, when we start comparing the Lord to, to things in our lives, that's treating Him as a common thing. The Lord is holy. He is holy. There, his holiness, like we said, transcends. There is nothing like Him ever. That's why He could tell Moses, my name is I am who I am. Not I am like that person or I am like that person. He's saying I am. There is, when he is saying I am who I am, he is saying there is nothing like me nowhere. Amen. Nowhere. Amen. In the Psalms it says that I, the Lord, dwell in a, a, a high and a lofty place. We, we, try to, we try to bring God down to our level so many times and God cannot do it. He cannot be reduced down to our level. We have to come up to Him. We have to come up to His holy hill. We cannot reduce Him down to us because we have blinded our own, own, our own eyes with idolatry and sin. Because we have treated His presence as a, as a common thing so long. That's when we start to see weirdness happening in, in, in some of the Christian media that is out there. Talking about God in allegories like He is just some mere man. They have no more reverence for the name of God. They have no more reverence for the holiness of God That's because they're probably not experiencing the holy of, holiness of God. They're probably not walking in the holiness of God. They're probably not meeting with the Lord until they experience that holiness, that sanctification, that set-apartness, that set-apartness where everything else doesn't matter. That set-apartness where... Doesn't matter who's doing what. Doesn't matter if they're all going to Six Flags. Doesn't matter if they're all going fishing, hunting. Doesn't matter if they're all going shooting. I am staying until I meet with God. I am staying until I meet with God. Let's, let's give a few scriptures on, on holiness. Where am I at? Exodus 15.11. Gonna, we're going to put these scriptures on the board as fast as we can because there's a progression to them. Exodus 15.11 Who among the gods is like you, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? Who is like the Lord? There is no one like the Lord. His holiness is so holy that He is majestic in His holiness. If you could catch a glimpse of the holiness of God, it would drive you absolutely nuts. How do I know that? Because that's what happened to the men in the Word of God who experienced His holiness. That's what happened to them. When they experienced the holiness of God, like Isaiah said, we're going to get to Isaiah 6. Woe is me. When they experienced the holiness of God, it is so uncomfortable. We were talking, Ella and I were talking to a man uh, just yesterday. And we just started to share the gospel with him. We started to share uh, uh, what it's like to experience a relationship with God and hear his voice. And I, I saw that those words were life to him because he had seen so many, uh, so many church practices that do not have any uh, God in it at all. He had seen so many things. And when I began to talk about hearing God's voice and a relationship with God's voice, he saw his face light up. And yet he was uncomfortable at the same time. Because he knew that in comparison to the holiness of God, he was so far away. There is a disparity between the two because he's not right with God. Men that have a vision of God's holiness, if you, you truly uh, set your heart out to seek God in his holiness, it's going to drive you a little bit crazy because you're going you're gonna to catch a glimpse of God and he's going he's gonna to blow your mind. You're going to catch a glimpse of God, and yet you're, you're not going to understand it, and you're going to understand it all at once. Amen. Amen. Deuteronomy 32.51. This is a parallel passage to what is going on in Numbers 20. This is because both of you broke faith with me in the presence of the Israelites at the waters of Meribah, Kadesh, in the desert of Zin, and because you did not uphold my holiness among the Israelites. Did God say anything about speaking to the rock, striking the rock? No. He says, because you did not, you did not uphold my holiness. You did, not, you did not show the entire Israelite community 
how sanctified I am by going and not doing what I said. Amen? Amen. Second Chronicles 20, 21. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they what? As they went out at the head of the army saying, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. These people are being, are being attacked from all sides. They're being surrounded. And what, what Je- Jehoshaphat does is he appoints not his army, he appoints his priests to go out in front of the army of the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness. The splendor of his holiness. Let's go to Psalm 96.9. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. What before him? Tremble. Tremble before him all the earth. Tremble before Him. When we hear about the holiness of God in our songs, we, we, <laughs> we almost treat it like it's a river to dance around in, right? We almost treat it like it's, it's you know, God's love. You know, it's a nice, nice thing. This is saying tremble before his, the splendor of His holiness. Tremble before it. Any of you ever do a word study on the word awesome in the Older Testament? You will find out that it's not like, like hey dude, that was awesome. You will find out that it actually means that it is the occurrence was so full of awe that it was terrifying enough for you to tremble in your knees. That when you saw the Lord, He was so uncommon. He was such a rare thing that when you saw Him, you trembled, you quaked because His holiness affected you in such a strong way. Psalm 93, verse 5. Your statutes stand firm. Holiness adorns your house for endless days, O Lord. His his house is built by holiness. His house is holy. His temple is holy. Everything about him is holy. And it is so uncommon from everything that we, we relate to. Isaiah 35, 8. And a highway will be there, and it will be called the way of holiness. And the unclean will not journey on it. It will be for those who walk in that way. Wicked fools will not go about it. Wicked fools. You ever hear the phrase, uh, fools rush in? Fools rush in where uh, angels fear to tread? Wicked fools. They have no idea about the holiness of God. They sputter out God's trinkets. They sputter out God's things like, like they're just common, like they're just nothing. Wicked fools read in Proverbs about, about fools and foolish men and what they do. It says things like, like their lips never stop speaking. They have no uh, regard for wisdom. All of those things. Wicked fools will not travel on it because they do not take the, the, the time and the adherence to get before the Lord and be patient with him, and, and know who he is. Ezekiel 38, 23. It's our last scripture for holiness. And so I will show my greatness and my holiness, and I will make myself known in the sight of many nations. What I want you to, to get, to grasp from these scriptures, is that when God decides to show up, when he decides to reveal himself to men, he always does it in his holiness. Because his, pri- his primary um, character trait of himself is that he is nothing like anything we have ever seen. That he is nothing like anything we're used to. He is so high and lofty where he dwells that when we think about him, it ought to, it ought to make us uh, want to change everything about us, does it not? Let's go to Isaiah 6. We're going to talk about a man that experienced the holiness of God. Isaiah 6, we're going to start in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. The train of his robe filled the temple. That's like, like what we'd say, our, our, uh, the length of our beards fill the room. <laughs> to the Lord, the train of his robe, a robe signified 
his exaltance. It signified his dignity. It signified his royalty, his robe. And the train of it was longer, <laughs> so long that it filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and two they covered their feet. And with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, and your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. He said, Go and tell this people. Stop right there. Isaiah is, um, there, there are many studies on what he's doing at this moment. Uh, some, are, some commentary wonder if he's like in a trance like Peter was when he was on the rooftop and he sees the vision. Uh, some are just wondering if he's fasting and praying. But the fact of the matter is, is that he is seeing into the temple. He is not seeing, uh, he's not seeing some kind of uh, mind revelation that is popping into his head. He is seeing into the temple of God. And he is trying to describe, he's saying above the Lord where Seraphs. Seraphs. The word seraph, uh, it, it, it means fiery serpent. But we know that these things, seraphs, uh, that's an interesting study too. We know that these things are probably more magnificent than you can ever imagine. And how do I know that? It's because of their proximity to God. If something can be in the presence of God like that, then these things must be majestic. We know that an angel of the Lord ran through a camp of Assyrians and 185, he didn't say he brought out his sword and went to work like, like, like Spartans did. He said that they ran through the camp and 185,000 men died in one night. One night. So what are these things doing in the presence of God? These things that are so majestic in holiness, what are they doing? They're not in front of the Lord. They're not being irreverent. I promise you, they're not sitting there uh, blaspheming the Lord's name. They are in the presence of God and they are covering themselves with their wings. They're covering their faces. They're covering their feet. And they're shouting, they're shouting, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. This word holy is another term that comes from this one. This is the verb. This one that we're talking about in Isaiah 6 is the noun, the someone that is holy, someone that is set apart. And they're saying, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. How many, how many songs that we know about talk about the Lord being love and nice and kind? And when, when these things see the Lord, they're saying He is holy. And not just holy, He is further than that. He is holy. Not just holy, holy. He is even further. He is holy in three times. Holy. They cannot stop praising Him. And at the, sound of, at the sound of their voices, the temple is shaking. The temple is shaking. And there is smoke filling the temple. And do you notice that the Lord is not... The Lord's not saying anything at this moment. He's not even speaking. Just, just His presence is causing these things to occur. Just His, his being there causes these things to occur. The smoke, the, de the doors of the temple start rattling. How many of you have ever gotten into the presence of God and you just start shaking? You just start shaking. You don't know why. Have any, have any of you, let me ask you this, have any of you ever been in the presence of God and the reality of His holiness is so strong that it shows you the disparity of your sinful nature where you cannot stop to think of every sinful thing that you have done Oh, my friends, if you've never experienced that, you need to get before the Lord like no else because you have not experienced the Lord if you haven't experienced that. You haven't experienced God if you have not experienced His holiness. You have not experienced God if you have not experienced His set-apartness, His sanctity, if you have not experienced that. And Isaiah is seeing, 
And it causes a reaction to occur in his heart. He says, woe is me. He starts proclaiming curses on himself. He's saying, I am a man of unclean lips. Not just what he, not just what he did. He's pronouncing woes on himself because of what he has said. Of what he has said. Perhaps he has blasphemed the name of the Lord once or twice. And yet when he sees the Lord, all of these things are reconciled to his memory. Because he is seeing God. And he says, not only that, I live amongst a people with unclean lips. How comfortable are you dwelling amongst people that have unclean lips? How zealous are you for God's house? Can you say like David, blessed is the man who does not sit in the seat of mockers, but delights in the law of God? Can you say that? Do you, are you comfortable sitting in the seat of mockers without saying anything? Or are you like Elihu in the book of Job and saying, listen to me, I'm about to tell you of the Lord. I'm about to tell you of the glories of the Lord. Ask yourself that. How comfortable are you day to day accepting garbage in one ear and out the other? Paying attention to, to I'm, I'm, just like, I'm just like everyone else. I have news apps. I have Facebook. I read things. There are things that, that fancy my interest. There are things that, that, that I look at every day. But the question is, is how comfortable are you with those things without getting into God's holy presence? How comfortable are you? We heard a teaching on Monday night. Three days is the normative uh, length for how long someone can go uh, between life and death. Three days. How long can you go without setting everything apart and saying, God, huh, show me yourself. Show me yourself, God. Lord, my feet are dirty. I have, been, I have been walking in an unclean place. I have been listening to people with unclean lips. Lord, I need to hear your voice. I need to hear your voice. He cries, woe is me, I am ruined. Verse 6, then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Let me just speak to, to your heart for a second. How many of you would love with everything in you to hear God say your sin is atoned for? It's one thing to read it in the Word. It's one thing to hear your pastors talk about it. It's one thing to hear people talk about it. But when you hear the Lord say, your guilt is taken away, what would you do to feel that? What would you do to feel that? And yet, many, many of us are comfortable to live without it. Leonard Ravenhill said the, the reason why we don't have revival is because we're comfortable. We're, we're content to live without revival. It's the reason why we don't have it. We're content with going through our daily lives uh, being normal, being common. We're called to be a holy people of God. We're called to dwell in His holy place with Him. And yet we're comfortable living as though we're just like the rest of the world. How many of you would, would just love to hear that? I believe you can. If you just separate yourself, you separate yourself from, uh, in 1 John 1, let's go to 1 John 1, 8. First John 1 John 1.8, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Okay, you already know. You already know that you're, you're not going to be perfect. Many of you listening here, if, if there, there are people, doubtless, that will hear what I am saying and say, okay, well, we're all, we, we are all sinners. We're all sinners saved by grace, so, so it really doesn't matter. No, it does matter. And yet, like, Eric, like our pastor Eric preached two weeks ago, tightrope and parking lots. There are some who, who feel like walking with the Lord is like walking on a tightrope, and some who, who disgrace the name of the Lord by saying it's like living in a parking lot. And yet, when you are experiencing the Lord rightly, it's both and. You're walking on a tightrope because you, at any moment, something can catch your eye. Calvé Comer, the light and the heavy. Something can catch you. And if you give in to that thought enough, that thought will become a desire. That desire will become an action. That action, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. At any time, you can turn to the Lord and say, Lord, I have sinned, 
And he is there. It says, if anyone has sinned, we have an advocate with the Father. But you can walk down that path of desiring and desiring and desiring and have unchecked motives, have unchecked desires in your heart, and continue on that path to, to eventually you've hardened yourself from God's presence. You have inoculated yourself from hearing his voice because you have stiff-armed the Holy Spirit for so long. Sin, sin will deceive you. Sin will deceive you. Amen? Amen. Where were we? Heard the voice of the Lord. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Next verse. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will, and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins. It is true that no matter how hard you strive, and you can strive and strive and strive to be perfect, but you know what? You won't be happy because your, your perfection is based. Your happiness is based on your perfection. If you admit that you are with sin, well, you're not a liar. But if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us. Not purify us so we can go back to our sin like a dog goes to his vomit, but purify us so that we can walk with God, with a clean conscience, dwelling with him, so we can experience his holiness. Amen? Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. When you hear the voice of the Lord say you're clean, you are forgiven, I have atoned for your sin, now you're, I'm ready, Lord, send me. I told Brother Steve one, one morning, man, when, when I'm filled with the Spirit, when I'm full of the Holy Ghost, I'm looking for a fight. Amen? I say, devil, how dare you? I would, I just, I'm looking for a fight. It's because I, I've got nothing to hide. I've got nothing holding me back. I've thrown off all the sin that easily entangles, and I am running, and I am running, and I am running. Amen? Amen. Let's go to Exodus 33. Exodus 33. Where are you at, Exodus? All of you are I'm using my wife's Bible today because she has an NIV, and I usually read an ESV. So I'm asking my my uh, NIV to give my ESV, or my ESV to give my NIV a double portion so that I can read it all to you. <laughs> uh, no, that's why we're going through the Hebrew. <laughs> you guys there in Exodus 33? Yeah. Exodus 33, 1. This is right after Moses comes down. He is meeting with the Lord on the mountain. And he, as he is coming down, Joshua says, I hear a sound of war breaking out in the camp. Moses, <laughs> that's not war. He go, they go down to find that the people have, had, had uh, incited themselves into such rebellion that, they, that they, they told Aaron to make them a golden calf. And they worshipped that golden calf and said, this is, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt. This is the God that brought us out of Egypt. In verse 1, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Leave this place, you and the people you brought up, out of Egypt, and go up to the land I promised an oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites. Pay attention to that. I will send an angel before you. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people, and I might destroy you on the way. When the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn, and no one put on any ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Tell the Israelites, you are a stiff-necked people. If I were to go with you, even for a moment, I might destroy you. Now take off your ornaments, and I will decide what to do with you. So the Israelites stripped off their ornaments at Mount Horeb. This is a, can you say that this is a trying time for Moses? This is a trying time for Moses. Uh, it's one thing if you fall into sin. It is one thing. It's another thing, another thing if you fall into sin and you're responsible for somebody. Another thing if, you, if the people that you're responsible for fall into sin. It's a whole other situation. It'll break the heart of every leader. Now Moses used to take a tent 
and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Everybody say the tent of meeting. meeting. This word tent of meeting. If you were to put that into a uh, concordance, you would find that it occurs, this is the first time the tent of meeting occurs in the scripture. But you, if you put it in an accordance, you will find that it occurs, uh, how do I explain it? It occurs more than this, but this specific tent of meeting, it's the first time it's talking about. The one that Moses pitched outside the camp. The word occurs 13 more times before this, talking about the tabernacle. It's Words are 168 for Ohel Moed, 4150. Ohel Moed. The English in the literal translation means the tabernacle of the congregation, the tent of meeting. The same word that is used for the tabernacle. If you read about it, it would it, thirteen times before this Moses. It talks about Moses uh, handing the instructions to Oholiab and Bezalel to to construct the the tabernacle of the con- the congregation. The uh, it calls it the tent of meeting, but it's talking about the tabernacle in which the priests minister, the tabernacle in which the people went and they went before the altar and they they brought their sacrifices and they burned them on the altar. Then the, the the blood was sprinkled on them. Then they would go before the basin and see the reflection. They were not allowed to go into the holy place, but they were they they saw the reflection. And once a year, once a year, a, a high priest would go into that holy of holies. I, I actually found an interesting little quote that you would like. Uh, This is from one of the rabbis. He says that God's word is great and holy. The holiest land in the world is the land of Israel. In the land of Israel, the holiest city is Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, the holiest place was the temple. And in the temple, the holiest spot was the holy of holies. Everybody registering with that? He's narrowing down the the holy place. There are 70 people in all the world. The holiest among there, among them is the people of Israel. The holiest of the people of Israel is the tribe of Levi. In the tribe of Levi, Levi, the holiest are the priests. Among the priests, the holiest was the high priest. There are 354 days in the lunar year. Among these, the holidays are holy. The holiest day among them is the Sabbath. Among the Sabbaths, the holiest is the Day of Atonement, the Sabbath of Sabbaths. There are 70 languages in the world. The holiest is Hebrew. Holier than all else, in, all else in this language is the Torah, the first five books, the law. And in the Torah, the holiest part is the Ten Commandments. In the Ten Commandments, the holiest is the name of God. Can you see that? You have a holy place, a holy man amongst a holy people in the uttering the holiest name on the holiest day. All of them are occurring. Can you, can you kind of see the reverence for the Day of Atonement in that? That day was the day that God set apart. But let me tell you a secret. That day is not limited to just that day for us now. That day is not limited to just the tabernacle of the congregation. Moses set up a tent of meeting outside the camp. It's almost like what's happening in the tabernacle of the congregation, what's happening in the tabernacle in the wilderness should be happening in the tent of meeting. Same word used. It's like the same system that should be happening there, there should be happening there, outside the camp, outside of the camp. Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp, some distance away, calling it the tent of of meeting, the tabernacle. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrances to their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. How would you like to have a relationship with God like that? When you go in to pray, everyone, everyone notices. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses, the pillar of cloud, the Holy Spirit. 
Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshipped, each at the entrance to his tent. And the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. God would speak to Moses face to face. This word face is panium. Panium. Where do I have panium? Face. It is Strong's 6440. It speaks literally of someone's face, but it also speaks to looking at something intimately. It speaks to the, to the identification of the, of the person, and it reflects the attitude and sentiments of that person. So when God was speaking to Moses, when God was speaking to Moses, it wasn't like he speaks to his prophets in, uh, in parables and other things. He's speaking to God face to face. You would, it's interesting. Let's go. Let's continue. Verse 12. Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so that I may know you and continue to find favor. Remember this nation is your people. Then the Lord replied, My presence will go with you. That word presence, same word, panium. My face, my presence. When the, when the word speaks of speaking face to face, it's talking about being intimate, intimate with someone. Someone's face is, is a, a signification of who they are, what they're doing, what, uh, what they're reflecting, the attitude that they have. If someone has a hard face, that means they're, 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 di- they're indignant. If someone is hiding one's face, he's, he's reserving himself. To see God's face is to see his character. To see, any of you uh, reminded of the psalm uh, in Psalm 34? Seeking the bread of God's face. When they're seeking God's face, His presence, His bread, His panium is is feeding. His panium is is, uh, an intimate relationship with Him Himself. It'll be interesting to see that later on, God tells Moses, you can't see my face. (laughs) You can't see it. But we can speak face to face. Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Isn't that interesting? You have not let me know whom you will send. He said he will send an angel. He will send an angel. But then he told Moses, I will not go myself. And what is Moses' response? You have said, I know you by name and have found favor. Again, how many of you would, would long to hear that from the Lord? I know you, remember? It's, it's the name of the book of Exodus. These are the names, Shemot. These are the names. God knows your name in the midst of trials. And it's not about God remembering your name. It's about you remembering God's name in your trial. But does God know your name this morning? Amen. You have said, I know you by name. And you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. I'm not going to go into the word no. Just, <laughs> I want to get into some, some stuff here in a second. But no, you guys are familiar with the teaching yada, to intimately know. He is asking the Lord. The Lord saying, I'm not going to go with you because I will destroy you. And he's saying, no, Lord, you said you know me by name. Now teach me your ways, Lord, so that I may know you. It's not good enough. You could look at, you could look at God working through Moses up till now. God has worked through Moses in such extraordinary ways. And yet that did not register to Moses knowing the Lord. That did not, that doesn't mean it's it's almost like in Matthew 7, Jesus can say, On that day, many will stand before me and say, Lord, Lord, I've done, I've prophesied in your name. I have spoken many things in your name. I have cast out demons in your name. And he's saying, but I will say to them, depart from me. I never knew you. I never knew you. Moses is asking God, Lord, Lord, in the midst of this trial, in the midst of everything that's going on, teach me your ways so that I can know you intimately. 
He is in the secret place, in the tent of meeting, asking God that he may know him. What is your response to a trial? What is your response to hardships in your, in your life? Is it you getting into the tent of meeting? Or do we post on Facebook all of, all of our complaints and grumblings, which we, we don't see them as, as railing against God, but they are. Amen. If God has put you where, where you are at, like he intended the Israelites to go, to go the longer way, if you're grumbling, you're grumbling against God. Is your, heart, is your heart reflecting that you want to know Him? And if it is, it will show up. It will show up in your actions. Do you want to know Him? Do you want to yada? Not just know of Him. Not just study theology. I remember I used, to, I, used, I used to have a hunger to know God. And you know what I did? Wasted my time. No, I would say waste. I would pull out theology books and read and read and read and read and you know what I was just as empty as ever after because I did not get in front of the Lord's presence I did not seek his face instead I sought theology I didn't seek his face I didn't hear from the Lord I, I had heard him a long time ago but at that point I wasn't hearing and it's almost like God was putting me in a situation so that I would cry out to him yes. and yet at the end of it in my failure uh, when I got back from, from Africa, I was like, Lord, what in the heck did you send me over there to do? Because I'm a wreck now. And it's almost like he told me, I, I, I put you there to struggle, to strive. You have said, I know you by name and have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Do you feel rested? In all of your works, do you feel rested? If you don't, possibly we're, we're striving without the presence of God. Possibly we're going so far out of God that we have forgotten to stop, stay still, and know that our God. Perhaps we have gotten so far we have filled ourselves with works and works and works and works and works and works, and, works, and we have forgot to seek the Lord's face. No, better yet, we have tried and we didn't get anywhere, so we stopped. We stopped seeking the Lord's face. Because possibly we didn't reverence the name. We came to him. Uh, James says, you ask, but you ask with wrong motives. You ask with wrong motives. Why do you want to experience the presence of God? Do you want to experience the presence of God so that you can be set apart in the eyes of your friends? I know, man, I can't tell you how I've struggled with that. Do you want to appear respectable in front of people? Or do you want, when no one else is watching, do you want to know the Lord? In the secret place, do you want to experience his holiness? In the secret place, do you want your holiness to exceed, exceed and exceed? The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest, rest, rest for your souls. Then Moses said to them, if your presence does not go, does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth. And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and know you by name. And then Moses said, now show me your glory. Show me your kabod, Lord. Show me your kabod. <laughs> God saw Moses' desire to know him. The Lord knows every thought and intention of the heart. He sees everything. In your prayer life, you might have, you might have not you might not have experienced God's presence in a very long time. And you might be running dry. Perhaps you need to get in front of the Lord and just confess like we read in 1 John 1, 9. Just say, Lord, I am so, I'm so miserable, Lord. I don't know why I'm doing what I'm doing. I think I'm doing this because I just want everyone else to look at me, Lord. Lord, I want you more than anything. And like what we heard Eric preach about, oh, when you pray that prayer, it's bittersweet, isn't it? <laughs> it's a bittersweet prayer. Because the Lord will answer. The Lord will answer. I'm just going to give you a few scriptures on seeking the Lord. We've got seven of them. Don't know why seven. Just seems to happen. Psalm 24, 3. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Next verse. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. Amen. He who does not lift up his soul to an idol. What will it cost you to get in God's presence? Perhaps you need to separate yourself from everything. Perhaps you need to smash 
our electronic gadgets. Perhaps that we need to get rid of the things that cause us to become entangled with sin. Deuteronomy 4.27. The Lord will scatter you. (laughs) This is good. The Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and only a few of you will survive among the nations which the Lord will drive you. (laughs) The Lord will scatter you. Next verse. There you will worship man-made gods of wood and stone, which cannot see, hear, or eat, or smell. Next verse. But if from there you seek the Lord, your God, you will find him if you look for him with all of your heart and with all of your soul. The Lord promised no matter where, no matter where you're at. You want to hear... You want to know the difference between the voice of God and the voice of the devil? The voice of God will speak the harshest things to you. Read through, read through Deuteronomy and find out what he says to those who turn their backs on the Lord. He <laughs> says, your, 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 your wives will be barren. Your children will be barren. Your land will be barren. I will send foreign armies to come and conquer you. You will be slaves. And what does the devil say? The devil says the same things. He comes to to lie. He is the accuser of the brethren. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But you want to know the difference? God's voice is always attached to the hope of returning to him. If you are constantly, constantly plagued by thoughts of condemnation, you need to get in front of God's presence. You need to hear from the Lord. You need to just ask the Lord, Lord, speak to me. I've got so many voices running through my head. Speak to me, Lord. Because the Lord promises that from there... If you seek the Lord, your God, you will find from there, from your place where you are being conquered, from the place where you are being destroyed, from there, if you seek the Lord, you will find him with all your heart. First Chronicles 28, 9. And you, my son Solomon, acknowledge the Lord, the God of your father, and serve, serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every motive behind the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. And if you have, have any of you ever paid attention to the scripture where Jesus says when you pray, don't pray with many words. Like the Gentiles do, they love to babble. For God does not hear you because of your many words, but he sees your heart. When we come into prayer, there's so... I. I can't tell you how long I I struggle with this and I struggle. It's like when you begin to seek God's face, he'll let you work all that out. He'll He'll let you work out all the Lord God I need favor. Lord God, I need to receive your blessing, Lord, because I want to feel you, Lord, because I want to. He'll work all that out until you get to a place where you are groaning inwardly. As your spirit cries out for his spirit, he'll let you get to that place because he sees your motives. We can be we can be blinded by our own motives. In the Proverbs, it says that, that the heart is, is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? It says that there is a way that seems right to man. In the end, it's death. There's a way to actually come to the Lord and think that we are doing well when the Lord sees every motive, and he, he just backs off for a while. He just hides his face. And, and you know what? If the Lord is hiding his face from you, let me tell you this. Proverbs 25.2 says that the... the to the glory, God has concealed things to the glory of God. It is the, to the glory of God to conceal a matter, to search out a matter is to the glory of kings. If he's hidden himself from you, it's to his glory so that you could seek him out and find him as treasure as he truly is. Treasure that is treasure is never easy to find, is it? No. no. It is hard to find, and when you find it, you keep it forever. I love how Nick shared pictures of his Bible, treasures that he had received from God. He wrote them down. We had heard from our pastor Eric about a word out of Exodus 15 that he personally revealed to him. You think that came easy? No. It always comes in our time of testing and trial where we need it the most. When Abraham was was failing, it seemed like the Lord showed up to him. When Jacob was fleeing from his brother, God shows up to him at Bethel. Shows up to him. In your place of trial, God, God will, will show up. God will hide himself so that you do seek after him. Isaiah 58, 1 through 4. Shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the house of Jacob their sins. Next verse. For day after day they seek me. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right. Right? 
and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They asked me, they ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Doesn't that seem, we'll go back. Doesn't that seem incredible? God is saying they seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right. They seem eager. Let's go to the next verse. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Man, that sounds a lot like, like Job. Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Verse 4. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. You could seek the Lord and seek the Lord, and yet he sees your heart. He sees your motive. It can, it can seem like you are eager to walk in his commands, and yet what's really going on? What's really going on after all the fasting is done? Jeremiah 29, 11. Everybody loves that verse. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Verse 12. Then you will call upon me and come to pray to me, and I will listen to you. Verse 13. You will seek me and find me when, everybody say when. When When you seek me with all of your heart. All of your heart. The Shema. Hear, O Lord. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is one. It talks about loving the Lord with all of our heart, mind, and soul. That's going to require some confession. That's going to require getting into God's presence and just getting past all of the fluff. Getting past all of the fluff. You will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Lamentations 3, 25. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. The Lord is good to those whose hope. Let me tell you this. Don't don't allow the enemy to steal what is good that is sown in your heart. This... This is intended to cause you to want to seek out the Lord, to cause you to say to yourself, you know what? I can do it. I can do it. It's for everyone. It says, the Lord is good to those whose hope is in him. In Psalm uh, Psalm 145, it talks about the Lord is near to all who call on him, all who call on him. Don't let the devil lie to you and tell you, tell you things that are not true. Seek the Lord till you hear his voice. Amen? Amen. And in Hebrews 11, 5 through 6. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. Verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he what? Rewards those who earnestly seek him. You must believe. Why does he say that? Why does he say that? Perhaps he has insight that there are people that are asking God and don't believe that he rewards those who seek him. Have any of you ever set your heart out to seek and pray and set your heart to to get before the Lord and immediately you're like, he's not going to hear it. Why do you do that? Why has your faith been so dwindled? Why is your faith in the mighty God the God who is a warrior, as Exodus 15 says, the God who is majestic in his holiness, why do you, why do you doubt the Lord? You know, that, you know that in James it talks about a double-minded man should not think he, he will receive anything from God? You should not think he will receive. If you're asking the Lord and yet doubting in your heart, you need to get before the Lord and experience him. You need to experience him. You know, the word says, to the faithful, he shows himself faithful. We have to develop a a pattern in a relationship of showing ourselves faithful. You want to know you want to know who stayed behind when Moses left the tent? Joshua did. You want to know who was called to lead the armies of Israel? Joshua was. How was it that Joshua was able, while all the other spies were saying, No, 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 don't go there. Don't don't go to that land because there is there are giants there. And Joshua and Caleb say, We are well able to take the land, for God is with us. Perhaps that he put in the time, he had the pattern of seeking, of being faithful to the Lord, and the Lord had shown himself repeatedly faithful on his behalf. 
You must believe when you seek the Lord that he will reward you that, that seeks him. And he's not going to reward you in this prosperity, uh, riches, and monetary trash that, that, that are so fleeting. So fleeting. It is better to have little with the righteous than to have much and dwell with the wicked. Man, it is better to have little and be in God's presence than to have much possessions and be without the Lord. And if you want to wear the name that says, Ichabod, the glory has departed, I want to dwell in the house of God forever. I want to be in the glory and the presence of God. I want to feel the weightiness. I want to say like Moses, I want to know you. We got a few more scriptures, then we're going to close. Uh, Hebrews 12, 7, let's turn there. Hebrews 12, 7. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we have respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought were best. God disciplines us. That word discipline in the Greek is paideia. Uh, I forgot the Greek word for it, so you study it. The, the, the word paideia doesn't refer to, um, it's more of like disciplining a child. I, I, I looked it up and I found that the same word is used in Ephesians 6.4, I believe. Ephesians 6.4 and it talks about not exasperating your children when you discipline them. Not exasperating them. When the Lord disciplines you, he's not trying to exasperate you. He is trying to cause, he's trying to give you instructions so that you grow. <laughs> your kids are like, amen, right? <laughs> discipline is not fun to receive. But you need to know that your discipline is not for no reason. And how does the Lord discipline us? That's a good question. It is true that... Like in, in Timothy, Paul wrote to Timothy, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But does that necessarily mean that that is what God uses to discipline? Because it's talking about hardships. Hardships. In, in James 1 it says, I found it. In James 1 it says, rejoice brothers when you, when you face trials of many kinds. Many kinds of trials. That means that there's not just one trial. It could be that your boss just is mad at you because you took a little bit longer on a job and he's going to make you work late on a Friday night when you want to be at Bible study. It could be that, the, that everything is going uh, absolutely the way you didn't intend it. It could be that everything is being flipped up on its end and that it all seems like it's pointed at you. Probably because it is. Probably when those things are occurring, we should remember the name of our Lord God because perhaps he is putting you in that situation like we talked about, that all of these things can be disciplined from the Lord. But, it, but if we continue in verse 10, verse 11, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. It doesn't seem pleasant. In verse 10, why, do, why does God say that he disciplines us? You see it right there? He disciplines us for our good, that we what? That we may share in his holiness. That we may share in his holiness. Man, when you think about discipline and you don't see the end result, it, it just seems hard. It seems horrible. But when you think about the end goal, his holiness, that discipline, discipline becomes pleasant, doesn't it not? When you think about God is putting me in this situation so that I can learn to share in his, his consecration, so that I can share in his sanctity, I can share in being set apart with him, I can share in him with that. That moment that was reserved just for the high priest no longer is just for the high priest in the Holy of Holies. It is for you. It is for you. And God disciplines us. He disciplines us so that we can share in that. That's a beautiful thing, is it not? Hey, <laughs> everybody say amen. amen. Let's go to Ephesians 
I'm sorry, go to, go to verse 20. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you have heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You are created to put off the old man, the old man that is corrupted by its sinful desires, and you are created... You are now recreated in God to be being transformed into the likeness of God, into his image, into his image. I I didn't share a scripture earlier, and I would, this is just a cool scripture. Go to uh, Exodus 24.10. When we talked about uh, ra'ah, to appear, it says that Moses and all of the elders, they they saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was something like a pavement made of sapphire, clear as the sky itself. Next verse. But God did not raise his hand against the leaders. They saw God, and underneath his feet was something like sapphire. And we are, we are created, recreated to be made into the likeness of his image, that holiness, that, that beautiful image of God. When we see the glory, the kabod, we are made to be recreated into that. Amen? Amen. Let's... Go to Romans 6.17. Romans 6.17. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I put this in human terms because you're weak in your natural selves, just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer them in slavery to righteousness leading to holiness. Righteousness leading to holiness. The calling is for you to offer the members of your body, your hands, your knees, your feet, no longer are to be members used to sin, but they're, they're supposed to be members submitted in slavery to righteous acts. How is righteousness, righteousness credited? By faith. Trust, grounded obedience causes you to walk out, causes you to act in faith and do those righteous deeds that you were called to do. You were, you were destined in Christ to do those righteous acts, and those righteous acts lead to holiness with God. Amen? I've got two more scriptures, and we're going to close. Exodus 34, 29 through 25. It says, When Moses came down from, the, from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant. And they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them. So Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him and he spoke to them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near him and he gave them all of the commands the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking to him, he put a veil over his face. Next verse. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out, he told the Israelites what had been commanded. Moses spoke with God to such an, an extent that it showed up on his face. His face was, sh- was so shining that the Israelites had to tell him, put, his, put your veil back on, Moses. His time in the presence of God reflected what he, what, what he physically looked like. And how many of us, why do, we, why do we hang our heads when we come into church in the morning? When we, when we come to Monday night Bible study, why do we hang our heads? You know, even, even in your worst trials, you still do not have a reason to hang your head. You still do not. Because you've been given the opportunity, like we're talking about, to, to share in His holiness. Your suffering's not for no reason. It says in Psalm 34 that those who look to Him are radiant. Their faces know no shame. Why do we hang our heads in shame? Because we have not sought the Lord. We have not been in His presence. I tell you this, you could get someone who has been in the presence of God and just put them right here on the stage and just look at them. Just look at them and they are beaming with life because they have spent time with the Lord God Almighty. 
And some of us, we need that refreshing. Some of us have been walking for, for five years, for one year, for two months, three months, ten years, twenty years. And how easy is it to go on and go on and go on? And we have not, and, and we, we just somehow got mixed up in the works. We treated God as unholy and He withdrew Himself from us. How many of us need to be refreshed in God's presence? We're going we're gonna to get into some worship and I don't exactly know what's going to happen. Because to be honest with you, what comes to your mind is that, oh, well, I've need to, I need to go before the altar. I need to go before the altar. I need to repent. I need to go before the altar. I need to cry out. I need to go before the altar. I need to do this. I need to go talk to this brother. I need to go talk to that brother. And to be honest with you, some of that's true. But what really needs to happen is that you need to get on your face and, and start getting on your face. You need to get before the Lord and experience His holiness. Some of you, I, I, myself included, the solution might not be that we come to an altar and we, we pray for 10 minutes till we feel good. Maybe we need to go home and get rid of everything that is in the house. Everything that is in the house that is sapping God's presence from our walk. Maybe we need to go home. You know, like Charles Finney encouraged the congregation. I don't, he said, I don't encourage you to, to come and pray a prayer. I don't encourage you to come and, and do this. Go home to your fields. Go home to your houses and cry out till the glory of God shows up. Cry out wherever you're at. Wherever you're at, cry out. And some of you, I'm not, I'm not talking against an altar call. Because we, got, we need to do that as a, as a corporate body. But the solution is not that you come down and you pray for five minutes and you leave and are not changed. The presence is that there is a, that a hunger develops in you for the holiness of God in your life. The holiness, where the holiness of God is no longer your secret holiness, but it becomes your testimony to the world. That they see that you have been with Jesus. They saw Peter and John, and they noted not their education, but they had been with Jesus. Some of us need, need to experience the holy, holiness of God like, no, like nothing else. We need to experience the kabod in our lives. We need to ask the Lord, Lord, show it to appear. Last scripture. 2 Corinthians 3. Second Corinthians three. Fifteen. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. Verse sixteen. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit; He is the Ruach, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Next verse. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is Spirit. Does that reflect your life? Does that reflect your walk? That you are beholding the Lord with an unveiled face? You are seeing the majesty and the riches and the wealth of God? And you're reflecting that image. You're reflecting that image into the world. Does that reflect your walk. Let's begin to worship.